Welcome to another episode of the Business of Biotech Summer Executive Sessions Edition. I'm Matt Piller, Chief Editor at Bioprocess Online and your host for this week's Up Close and Personal Conversation with Dr. Christopher Anzalone, President, CEO, and Director at Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Anzalone was an NIH-supported postdoctoral fellow in reproductive endocrinology at the Smithsonian Institution's Conservation and Research Center prior to managing private equity for Galway Partners and prior to the founding of his own nanobiotechnology private equity firm, the Bennett Group, in 2005. He joined Arrowhead, uh, which boasts a deep pipeline of therapies developed to silence the genes that cause intractable diseases using RNA chemistry back in 2007. And today, we're going to learn a little bit uh, more about Dr. Anzalone, his company, and why they're both committed to taking RNA interference beyond the liver. Dr. Anzalone, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Good to be here. Did I get all that right? Did I make any mistakes in your, uh, your, your brief intro there? So far, so good. All right, good, good. So I want to start at a high level uh, and, and learn a little bit about you and uh, kind of what led into the, the founding of, of Arrowhead. Uh, so I'll start with a very simple question. When you made that move, what, what was the inspiration behind making the move from private equity and taking the reins at Arrowhead? Yeah, so so I didn't I didn't start Arrowhead. Uh, Arrowhead was it was an existing company at the time. It was publicly traded. So uh, there's the there's there's my first mistake of many. Okay, Correct me. Well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, it was it was an existing company. Um, there were two things that that intrigued me about that opportunity. Uh, one was that it was a turnaround. Uh, it was a broken company with a broken business model, uh, and I thought that was an interesting challenge. Um, it was it was an unfocused company. Uh, it was a nanotechnology holding company at the time. Uh, with the idea that that it was providing exposure to these nanotechnology opportunities to the public investor, um, and so it had a number of majority owned subsidiaries underneath it. And again, that model didn't seem to work to me, at least, uh, because there were no synergy among those companies, uh, and it was going to be very difficult for any investors to really understand um, the business, right? Um, so anyway, so it was a, it was a, it was a turnaround that was interesting to me. But second, and probably more importantly, was that they had a small uh, RNAi company called Palando Pharmaceuticals as one of its subsidiaries, and 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 as they as I looked at, at what they had, that was interesting, and I thought that was the future. Um, you know, if you could harness RNA interference, and and gosh, I think I won the Nobel Prize in 2006 or thereabouts, um, and so it was it was a brand new technology um, when I joined. Yeah. Um, uh, but it was it was it was potentially so powerful that that I thought, look, let's. Um, I would be interested in taking the reins here if we could rationalize the business and make it a more traditional biotech company and focus only on that technology. And so I told them, look, you know, if you want to do that, I'll do it. If you don't, that's okay too. We can have beers and be friends, but but I'm not going to uh, join the company uh, otherwise. Uh, and and the board was very generous um, with respect to to that sort of freedom. Um, and so we decided to do it. Um, and I I thought I needed a good year of upmarket. To 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 fix that business uh, because you know it's it's a it was a it was a a, um, a capital intensive business that was not well understood and and so I needed some uh, I thought I needed some some uh, win at my back and I had a, I got a quarter um, you know March of 2008 rolls around and and Bear Stearns goes belly up and and then all hell breaks loose yeah. so it took it took longer to rationalize the business than I expected but we were able to do it still. Yeah, and in relatively short order. I mean, you talk about the you know the recession impacting things. You talk about taking a small element of the company and its RNAi technology and kind of focusing on that. And, and like I said, within short order, by uh, 2011, you your your company really you know put itself out there by acquiring uh, Roche's RNAi assets, and then uh, and just a few years later, buying all of Novartis's RNAi assets. Uh, which, by the way, there's a, a great story. My colleague, Rob Wright, the chief editor at Life Science Leader, wrote a really great story on your company that kind of walked through those purchases. Uh, I believe it was in our April uh, 2020 issue of Life Science Leader. So check that out. But um, as I said, you, you, you really you know, took something small, had some headwinds right off the bat, uh, but then made some very significant investments, kind of stuck the company's neck out to acquire that technology. Uh, what is it about this technology that makes you so confident and willing to, to, to make those moves? 
Well, first of all, so so you say short order, short order for you in retrospect, you know, mm -hmm. when, when we were living it, it was long order, you know, big time, you know, it yeah. was, it was a difficult time, you know, in the in the world, much less, you know, to be at a company that's capital intensive and, and trying to fix itself. It's funny, as a quick aside, I remember I was talking to my father, you know, during this whole period, and, and, um, and he said, he said, uh, you know, are you sorry that you made the move? Um, you know, because because you, you seemed happy at, you know, um, um, at the at the prior job. And, and now now it's difficult here. And I said, I said, actually, uh, I view the whole the whole meltdown as a gift, you know, because the only way to know how to to, you know, to dig yourself out of out of the mother of all holes is to dig yourself out of the mother of all, of all holes. And hopefully I don't have to do that again. But 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 I learned how to do it. So yeah. anyway, um, so it, it took a while, but we got there. Um, um, so to your question, um, uh, you know what, um, uh, you know what drew what 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 uh, uh, drew us to to making those bets. I think I think that RNAi is the best bet in biotech, and that sounds like hyperbole, but I really I believe it then. I believe it now. You know, it is it's it is um, it is a, a a mechanism with surgical precision. You know, if you do it right, you can you, you can silence a single gene, uh, and that is extraordinarily powerful. You know, again, if you do it right, and if you and if you are if you are addressing the right gene, uh, there is just nothing with that sort of with that sort of specificity. And so that 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 alone is is extraordinarily powerful for a number of, of different uh, disease states. Um, second, it's non permanent. You know, people talk about gene therapy, this CRISPR, and and and, and, and the like, uh, and those are you know that's an interesting idea, but the permanence of that is frightening, uh, at least right now. You know, there's a long way to go. I think. For just from my perspective, um, uh, between now and, and being comfortable with changing somebody's genome, for goodness sakes, you know, the first person that needs to be uncrisperized makes me nervous. And so yeah. the, the 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 lack of permanence of RNAi um, is attractive to me. But then you layer on top of that the durability of this. Um, it was, it's a really amazing combination. You know, we've got we have some drugs that 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 show you know, activity for more than six months. And so it's a pretty, it's a pretty neat idea that you can turn off a single gene, uh, you know, with a single subcutaneous injection for over six months. Uh, and again, if you choose that gene right, uh, I think that's going to change a lot of lives. And so, so, you know, those things, those things made this an opportunity that we just needed to jump on. Uh, yeah. And we need to continue to, you know, to, to push forward, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And in that, uh, in that response, you, you said, you know, if it's done right, if you choose the gene properly, uh, I, I want to ask a question about uh, some of those ifs that sort of uh, predates my immersion in the space. So forgive me. Uh, but I, I read, you know, in the earlier days of RNAi therapy, uh, there were some off target effect and toxicity and delivery method challenges that were, were, were uh, perhaps difficult to overcome at the time. Uh, maybe maybe that alludes to some of those ifs. Can you kind of walk us through how Arrowhead has tackled some of those challenges? Right. Yeah, so the ifs that I talk about there don't relate to that. But 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 oh but okay. Let, but but I'll, I'll talk about both those. So first, so so you mentioned the you know off target effects, toxicity. Um, you know that that is a single problem, and that problem is delivery. Um, that has been the cornerstone, the, you know, the the challenge of this industry from the get go. Um, and and it took us in the field, you know, the whole field over a decade, you know, to wrestle that to the ground, but we, I think we've finally gotten there. You know, the, the, so just to take a step back, you know, what we are doing is we're introducing a small RNA molecule into a certain cell, right? You know, and that RNA molecule, which is, you know, a small number of, of, um, of all the nucleotides um, will, will uh, initiate this, this natural process of, um, of downregulating um, the expression of a certain gene, right? Uh, so, so that small RNA molecule is inert. It doesn't do anything. You know, it's not toxic. It's 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 perfectly acceptable. That which we put on it, or or uh, um, or or put around it, you know, can it can confer that toxicity. And so, when we were when the whole field was struggling with how do we deliver these these small fragile molecules, we were sticking on on those molecules these toxic things. And so, it took us a while to understand how to just strip that away. And make it a very simple, at least at least conceptually, uh, process. And that process is is a small, you know, RNA molecule that you chemically modify. So it's so it's not going to be degraded. Um, if you do that correctly, you can do that in a in a reasonably non-toxic way. Um, and then you 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 tether to that 
a targeting ligand, you know, some molecule that will naturally bind a certain cell type and be, and be absorbed by that cell type. If you can do all those things, then you can get your molecule into the right cell at the right time. And again, it took, it took a, a long time to, to, to really uh, understand that science, but, but we're there. And, you know, I think of, of innovation in sort of two large buckets, right? There's science and there's, and there's engineering. Science is, is, um, is, is harder than engineering in my mind um, because it's unknown. Engineering is once you have something that works, you, you optimize it. We are absolutely in the engineering phase of RNAi, at least as it relates to delivery to, uh, to, uh, to liver cells. So, um, so, you know, so, you know, that's the, those are the challenges around toxicity that you mentioned and such. The ifs that I mentioned are really knowable ifs. You know, these are these are, you know, uh, if we turn off this target gene, what will happen? In a lot of in a lot of situations, that is a knowable thing. Uh, you know, we talk about about uh, genetically validated targets a lot, and and one of the things we mean by that is is uh, is understanding you know genes that are that are that are not expressed in certain humans, right? And 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 if you can study those people, you can understand if there is a negative phenotype associated with the lack of, of, of expression of that one gene. So 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 uh, you know, if you um, uh, if you do it right, and if you and if you if you can find these genetically validated targets, you have a good idea about about uh, uh, negative things that could happen um, if you turn that off. And so and so. If you if you can get beyond that and say okay you know, yes um, um, if you turn off that gene a good thing will happen and bad things look like will not happen now how do you make sure that you're not knocking down other genes right because you know other genes could have can have similar similar sequences and that is generally a knowable thing as well because the you know the human genome is sequenced and so and so you know we can uh, it is a known unknown if you will you know to to paraphrase uh, Don Rumsfeld um, sure. uh, and that that's also what's really attractive about this field is that is that the 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 number of of known unknowns uh, is is relatively high, and so I think we can go into clinical studies relatively de-risked. You know, a small molecule to know a small molecule is to know a small molecule. You don't know you know how it's going to interact with other cells. You don't know how it's going to uh, interact with with other organ systems and such. And so and so you go into clinical studies uh, not knowing a lot, and and that's why that's why drugs fail in clinical trials. Uh, yeah. With RNA interference, I think that you go in knowing a heck of a lot more. Yeah, okay. The Business of Biotech is produced by Bioprocess Online in partnership with Cytiva. If you're the leader of an early to clinical stage biotech, you need to check out the resources that are hand curated for people like you at CytivaLifeSciences.com backslash Emerging Biotech. The Knowledge Center there is chock full of articles, webinars, videos, podcasts, and other content that's ultra focused on helping new and emerging biotechs chart the course to the clinic and beyond. Check it out, cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. I wanna shift gears here a little bit and, and get into the liver. Uh, your recent focus has been on taking RNAi beyond the liver. Uh, but before we discuss your vision for new indications, uh, a couple questions. Let's talk about where the therapy stands with uh, your initial targets, uh, which I believe are the hepatitis B virus and alpha-1 liver disease. And maybe give us a little color on, on why that was sort of the genesis area for RNAi technology. Right. So, so first of all, and, and, and I'll, let me circle back to, to your question, but first of all, uh, we've, got, we've got other liver-directed uh, drugs. We are going after hepatitis B and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency related liver disease, but we have other ones as well that we'll talk about in a second. Okay. Um, so, so the reason that the liver was, was a good initial um, uh, organ target was that it's a clearance organ, right? So, so you know, it wants to, to soak up things from the blood. Uh, um, and so it, it, is, it is, relatively speaking, straightforward to bring in molecules into, into not all liver cells, but hepatocytes, you know, you know these, um, uh, because, because you know, that's one of their jobs. Um, uh, so that's a B. Uh, the field, not just us, but the field, has identified good targeting ligands. You know, good, good molecules that, that are taken up rapidly by hepatocytes. Um, um, and so you, you know, you combine those two things, and 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 hepatocytes are really tailor made for you know for RNAi. Uh, that's the good news. The, the other piece of good news there is that there are an awful lot of good targets you can go after. There, are, you know, the liver makes a lot of things, mm -hmm. um, and so so there are a lot of opportunities. 
you know, to, 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 to develop really powerful medicines if you can only focus on the liver. And so that was, that was clearly an important space for us. But we thought more broadly, you know, to really, you know, to really extract all the value from RNA interference and to really revolutionize, you know, medicine, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, um, we needed to bring RNAi outside the liver, you know, because there are other diseases, you know, that, that, that needed to be addressed. Um, sure. So, so that was that 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 that's that was our thinking on this. Now back to the to to our compounds um, that are liver focused. As you mentioned, uh, we have one um, that's partnered with Johnson and Johnson uh, against hepatitis B infection. That seemed to be an important opportunity for us because because it is a great unmet medical need. You know, there may be 300, you know, to 350, you know, million people on the planet with with chronic hepatitis B infection. There's no cure, uh, and we thought that we could play there. Um, and so far, so far, you know, I think that we've got a, you know, a powerful uh, medicine that, that could lead to functional cures. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we'll see. Uh, uh, the other one you mentioned was was alpha one antitrypsin deficiency related liver disease. Uh, this also was it was we think um, a strong unmet medical need. It's a much smaller market, of course, uh, but but um, the biology of that seemed clear. You know, we know that that in these patients um, there is a a protein that 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 is produced. That can cause liver disease in, in a subpopulation of those people, and we thought we could turn that off. And we're in the process of, of showing that right now. We think that's important. But beyond those two, you know, look, we we also have um, a program, a cardiovascular program that we've partnered with with Amgen uh, against something called LP little A. It's a it is a genetically validated uh, target that that appears uh, in some individuals. It appears that the elevated levels of this are so. Are, are, are an independent risk factor of cardiovascular disease. And so we're excited about their progress there. Um, internally, we've got um, two cardiometabolic programs, uh, one uh, called Aero A plus C3. Um, that is a triglyceride lowering um, a drug. And we showed recently that we can lower triglycerides by 95% in patients. You know, it's just stunning. And there's nothing out there that, that can do that, we don't, I don't think. Um, uh, the other one is called Aero Ang3. Uh, that looks like it can lower triglycerides as well as lower LDL or so-called bad cholesterol. Um, um, and, and it will lower that LDL on top of the lowering that you see with statins and, 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 and other modalities. Um, um, again, in patients, we've seen you know 85% reduction of triglycerides with AeroAnge 3 and 40% reduction of LDL. So we think that's a really powerful cardiometabolic um, medicine as well. You then go to, to NASH. Um, you know, this is, this is, you know, a disease of, 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 of increasing focus, you know, with big pharma. Um, uh, and, and we have a, a genetically validated uh, target that we're going after uh, called, um, called HSD. They, the drug is, is, is Aero HSD. We are treating healthy volunteers and patients right now. Um, what am I forgetting? I guess, in, so those are our, our liver directed uh, uh, disease, uh, uh, medicines right now. Yeah, yeah. So, uh... And before we kind of shift gears into other indications, uh, have there been any particular process or manufacturing challenges leading up to your, you know, your journey into phase two uh, that, that uh, I guess, posed a particular conundrum for you that needed to be overcome? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, we've spent a lot of time on, on, uh, on manufacturing internally. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, we have redundant uh, suppliers, and so we also use CMOs to, to manufacture for us. But but we really wanted to, um, you know, to be able to control that more than we were in the past, and so and so we have the ability now to make GMP grade material, and and we'll scale that up. Uh, you know, we a, a hallmark of our company has been speed, uh, and that was one area that we saw that we could really shave months off off um, off program uh, time schedules by by controlling our own manufacturing at least at least in the early stages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Um, so yeah, let's let's move beyond the liver then. What indications are you targeting beyond liver disease, and uh, what's the scientific rationale behind their prioritization? Like, how did you go about choosing these targets? Sure. So, so let, let's look at that chronologically. I guess we started looking at at solid tumor delivery some time ago, years ago, uh, um, um, for a couple reasons. You know, first uh, we thought that that could be. You know, um, a, a a potential next next uh, cell type that we can go after, um, mm -hmm. but also we viewed that as a test kitchen, right? You know, uh, we learned an awful lot about how to bring molecules into cells that were not hepatocytes via that program, 
Uh, so, you know, many years later, we, we, we came up with, with this platform that we think is a franchise unto itself that allows us to, to, uh, to deliver to solid tumors. Our first program there um, is against a renal cell carcinoma. Um, and we are, we are in a phase one, two study uh, right now uh, with that. Um, I think that that's important because, because I, th I think it's potentially important medicine for renal cell carcinoma. And I think will be one of those really uncommon oncology drugs that, that doesn't make you sick. Um, and so should be mm. combinable with a number of other, of other uh, chemotherapeutics. And so we're excited about that, but it's also the sharp end of a spear. I think once we show that we are knocking down the target gene, um, in this case, uh, HIF2 alpha, um, um, in these solid tumors, then, then, then uh, it is proof of concept that we can get into solid tumors. And then we can, we, then we can rapidly you know, blow out that pipeline and go after other tumor types, go after you know, other uh, gene targets. Uh, so, so certainly solid tumors is an important one. Um, but what has moved even faster than that is lung. You know, we, we, we started working on delivering to, to pulmonary epithelial cells several years ago, and we've gotten really good at that. We have, we have one compound right now called AeroENAC um, um, in, the, in the clinic, um, and we'll, we'll be dosing patients shortly, I believe. My hope is that over the next you know, month or so, we can start dosing patients. Um, the initial indication there is cystic fibrosis. Uh, we are going after a validated target that, that Big Pharma has tried to go after in the past, but, but could not for various reasons. We think RNAi is, is uniquely suited for this. Um, and importantly, it's administered via inhalation. And so that's a big step forward for us. Um, you know, we think it's, it's a powerful medicine for cystic fibrosis. And, and you look at that, at that landscape and you say, okay, well, Vertex has done a great job with CF and they certainly have. Um, but there, but there, are, there, are, there are large pockets of, of, uh, of patients that are not served by, by existing drugs. And we think that, that we can help them quite quickly. And then, and then we'll see how we can expand beyond that. So, so you know, AeroENAC, um, our, you know, the, the, the CF uh, program, as with uh, our cell tumor program, is we think a powerful medicine for the target population we're going after, cystic fibrosis patients. But we think it's also a good proof of concept. Once we show you know, that, that we are, that we are uh, doing what we intend to do in the lung, we can rapidly expand that pipeline. And the lung is a target rich organ. Um, you know, we have already, we've said publicly that, that we expect to, you know, to file to begin clinical studies for our next lung program, you know, by the very end of this year. We haven't said what target is, we haven't said what the, um, what the gene target is. We, we have said that it's against COPD. Um, mm -hmm. um, but, but I think that we'll have, I think that will, will be, uh, uh, that's near term. And then I think next year we'll have one or maybe two additional uh, uh, lung drugs in the clinic. Um, again, I think I think I think that's a very important um, set of programs for us and for the field uh, because again, it's a target-rich environment. Um, there are an awful lot of indications that we can go after um, using RNAi that that are undruggable by by, by uh, other mechanisms. So we're excited about that. Um, and then we also have said that that we are targeting skeletal muscle. Um, I expect that we'll, we'll be in the clinic there the first half of, of next year. We haven't said the target, we haven't said the, uh, the indication, but we view that as also important. And so, you know, by the middle of next year, we'll be in what, uh, hepatocytes, uh, uh, lung, solid tumor, uh, and muscle cells, so we, we four different cell types. And then I think next year, maybe towards the end of the year, uh, there's a reasonable chance that we could be at our next cell type. And so I think, you know, we are, we're, we are pushing uh, this technology forward as quickly as we can into as many new areas as we can. Yeah. So I, I got to ask you how that affects you uh, as the leader of the organization and how it affects the organization just from a tooling up standpoint, from a, a hiring standpoint, an organizational standpoint, when you have such a variety of indications and cell types that you're tackling. Is the, with this particular technology, is there a bunch of change that has to happen to be able to move into these new indications or, or is it, uh, you know, sort of a one size fits all approach? Yeah. Well, so the G forces will kill you, you know, we're, 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 probably, <laughs> we're, we're moving so quickly. Yeah. Um, but I tell you, you know, from a, from a fluffy standpoint, right. You know, you know, not, you know, from a, from a, uh, an emotional standpoint, this is where you want to be. You know, I, you know, I, I think that the people here and I, and I certainly speak for myself, but I think the other people here at Arrowhead, you know, uh, have, have a really good reason to get up in the morning because this is exciting science. Um, I think we are pushing medicine quickly uh, and, and there will be literally, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of people whose lives will be affected by the work people are doing at Arrowhead today. 
and and because we because we're so fast, people can see this, right? You know, it's it, you know people can see the movement of 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 of, of, of developing new science, and then and then how that how that fits into people's lives, you know, in a pretty short period of time. It's it's extraordinarily exciting, and I tell you, it's a gift um, that we all we all appreciate. You know, that it's unique that we get to do this. Anyway, so the fluffy aside. The, yeah. the nuts and bolts are 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 complicated. It's not one size fits all. What we have going for us is that is that they all leverage RNA interference, and so we can be experts in RNA interference and the chemistry of RNA interference. That that's that in that scalable and that that's applicable to everything we're going after. You know, the molecule doesn't care what gene it's knocking down, right? You know, it can be it can be, you know, a a, a epithelial sodium channel cell you know, or uh, sorry, a gene in in uh, in pulmonary epithelial cells. Or it can be an alpha one gypsum deficiency, um, you know, a target in 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 hepatocytes. It doesn't matter. Um, um, so so that that scale. The challenge here is 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 scaling our ability, uh, you know, to get into these new cell types and understanding new targeting ligands and understanding, um, you know, PK. You know, how do you extend? How do you expand the PK? You know, in these new molecules. You know, to 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 have enough. Uh, interaction with with cell surface receptors in new cell types. You know that's all complicated, and that's not one size fits all. You've got to be you've got to be pretty good um, in other areas. Um, so it, so that's the challenge, and 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 having enough biology expertise in these new areas to ask the right questions. But I'll tell you, and this is going to sound a little bit anti intellectual, but I but but bear with me. I tell you, I think it's I think it is helpful for us not to be deep incumbents in some of the areas we're going after. You know, if you look at, at 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 who drives true innovation, who drives paradigm shifts, it's it's infrequently the deep incumbents because they're they're mired in the dogma. It is the outsiders who ask who ask dumb questions, you know, and, and who can approach a new area, you know, with almost childlike naivete, right? You know, to say, well, wouldn't it be cool if you could do X? You know, uh, I wonder if we can do Y. Um, and it is it is very often the newcomers who can ask those those fresh questions. Uh, and it is my hope that that by 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 expanding our reach into these new areas, that we can continue to ask those really, you know, probing, uh, innovative questions. Yeah. Well, if it weren't for uh, childlike naivete and uh, dumb questions, I wouldn't have a job. So I appreciate the yeah. the, the reference there. And I, I, when I say I appreciate it, I mean it sticks. Um, <laughs> Uh, so how do you, you mentioned the, you mentioned these challenges because it's not one size fits all. And the fact that you have to have, you know, very, uh, deep expertise in the, in the biology, uh, for each of these indications, how, how, like, just, just give me some, some, uh, time on how you go about, is, is that as simple as, you know, uh, attracting the people with the intellectual capital to, to move those, those forward? What, what's the, what's the, uh, the key there? Sure. Um, uh, so, so, so let me start with, with, we try to make life as easy for ourselves as we can, uh, and one of the ways we do that is to focus on well-validated targets, right? So, mm -hmm. so um, you know, there, there, there are there are more than two ways, but I think the way I think of it, there are, there are two primary ways you can you can you can address these sorts of things. One is to is to is to be very deep in the biology of a disease and 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 push that disease biology forward and find new ways to address that disease. That's that's important and it's good and it but it's hard and it and, and requires years of experience in a certain disease area. The second way is to is to stand on the shoulders of that first group of people um, and 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 go after these these well validated targets. And so you're not having to to invent, if you will, new biology. That's where we start, you know. And so if you if you look at, at everything we do, um, we have not. Uh, we have we have not invented new new gene targets. We've gone after those that have been that have been studied for quite some time, but have not been able to be addressed in a in a therapeutic manner. Um, we view that as a as as a good model for us. Now, at some point, you, you might run out of those, in which case you've got to you've got to you know, roll up your sleeves and and do more basic biology work. But um, but for now, you know we can we can focus on those. And I tell you, that's important for a few reasons. One. Um, it de-risks these these programs, and so we go into the clinic. I think with a level of um, uh, of risk that is that is less than 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 most small molecules, if you will, because because we're you know we we have a we have pretty good confidence that RNAi is a is a is a reliable process, um, and we also have 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 a good understanding that the gene targets we're going after um, you know, are important for a certain disease process. 
Um, so so it, it's certainly helpful from that standpoint and also allows us to move a bit more quickly, right? You know, we can, we can, we can stand on the shoulders of these, of these uh, biologists who have done good, important work in these areas and then and, 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 um, and create these medicines pretty quickly. You know, what we've shown is, is we've gone from, from idea to the clinic in 12 to 18 months, you know, in, in many of our at least uh, hepatocyte targeting programs. And that's unheard of in the field. It's just unheard of. Um, yeah. And that's and look, it's important for our company clearly, but but you know we always think about this from the patient's perspective. This is important for patients because you know if you are a patient in need of these medicines every day that they don't have access to these medicines is a bad day for them. And so and so you know we 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 tell our 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 people that all the time that that those patients are our bosses and think about what they need and that drives us. Excellent. So uh, I mentioned earlier your acquisition of Novartis, uh, Novartis's RNAI assets back in 2015. Um, and as you know, this year, Novartis got back in the RNAI game uh, with the medicine company, the acquisition of the medicine company and its uh, RNAI heart drug in Clisseran. Did I pronounce yep. that correctly? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what, uh, that makes me curious about your assessment of the competitive landscape in this space, uh, the, I guess, in, in increasing or renewed interest in taking RNAi beyond the liver. What's, what's your take on that? Sure. The, the, the world has, has come around to RNAi. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is well accepted now that this is, a, this is a validated therapeutic modality that can do things that other modalities can't do. And, and that, look, it's not right for, for all diseases. But there are a lot of indications where, where, you know, this is a powerful modality. Um, people get that now. Um, you know, you talk about about Novartis getting back into the space, and and you know, people have asked about that. And you know, they they say, you know, uh, do you think Novartis feels foolish about this and such? And and the answer is absolutely not. I think I think that's an example of of our industry working the way it should work. You know, small biotech companies are just better and faster at innovation than big pharma. I think big pharma would even, would even accept that. Yeah. Um, um, and so, so the world should rely on us to do that innovation. Now, big pharma is really good at later stage, you know, large clinical studies, and obviously you know, quite good at, at distributing, distributing and manufacturing drugs. They should focus on those things. And this is a good example of that. I think it's a good partnership. You know, El Nylum and then medicines company uh, you know, push that drug forward, and then Novartis is going to do what they do well and, and bring it to the masses. Um, I yeah. think that's it's a really nice case study as how as to how biopharma should work. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's a refreshing response. Uh, so we're running short on time, Dr. Anzalone. I know you need to uh, get get running, uh, but I want to give you an opportunity to share some concluding thoughts, uh, knowing that our audience is comprised of folks who are perhaps first time leaders of new and emerging biopharmas. Uh, perhaps those who have been around the block a few different times, but are working on new indications and with new uh, therapeutics um, and new companies, new organizations. Uh, so whether it's, you know, uh, I guess directly related to the emergence of RNAi or just, you know, from the perspective of, of a successful leader, uh, what concluding thoughts would you leave for, for this group of people? Yeah, you know, I don't know. Uh, um... <laughs> I think this is a very exciting time. You know, so COVID be damned. Look, I, I think this is a very exciting time um, in RNA interference. Um, it is, it is, it's finally validated. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, I think, I think we are now just starting the process of bringing this, you know, into, into, um, into the world for, you know, for various diseases. And I think that we are in the first inning to mix my, my metaphors, the first inning of this game. And I think, I think you'll see over the next several years, dozens of really powerful medicines um, uh, that would come into to patients. I think it's really exciting. More broadly, look, I think it's an exciting time to be in biopharma. You know, there's yeah. an awful lot of exciting new, new uh, technologies that are, that are moving um, uh, by historical standards quite quickly. Um, so, you know, look, I think it's a great time to be in this field. And, it's, and, and look, I'm proud to be in this field. Um, you know, we're doing good things. Uh, and, and, you know, depending upon the the, the time of year and what politicians are talking about, we can sometimes get a get a bad rap. But I think that that people need to stay focused on on what our what our priorities are here, and it's it is to make important medicines that will have, that will affect people's lives. And I think we're good at doing that. Yeah, I was just having a conversation with someone a little bit earlier today about the fact that uh, it it seemed like just what six eight months ago, 
uh, pharma and biopharma uh, was sort of the favorite, uh, you know, excuse the, the, the worn out um, metaphor, but redheaded stepchild of, <laughs> of, the, of the government, right? Uh, and now, you know, there's an opportunity for, uh, for us to be the, the, the saviors, the heroes. Amen. Yeah. Well, Dr. Anzalone, keep up the good work. Congratulations on your success to date. Uh, and thank you very much for spending some time with us. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much, Matt. So that's Dr. Christopher Anzalone. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech Summer Executive Sessions. We're produced by Bioprocess Online, and we're graciously supported by Cytiva. And I encourage you to check out the host of excellent resources for emerging biotechs at Cytiva uh, at the URL citivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. In the meantime, visit bioprocessonline.com, subscribe to our newsletter, be sure to subscribe to this podcast, and thank you for listening.